In this video, we're going to cover five common questions on the water treatment operator certification exam. Note that this video is for newer operators studying for the first two certification levels. A common type of question that you'll see on exam will be on drinking water regulations. And they may test you on any of the regulations out there such as the surface water treatment rule, the lead and copper rule, the total coliform rule, or the groundwater rule. This particular question is on the lead and copper rule. The question reads, how long are you required to keep the tap closed before you grab a sample for lead and copper? The answer choices are three hours, four hours, five hours, or six hours. The correct answer is D, six hours. Under the lead and copper rule, you're required to let the water sit in the plumbing for at least six hours before you grab a sample. If you want to learn more about it, go to the textbook, Water Treatment Plant Operation, Volume 1, and on page 533, it explains it in more detail. If you want to learn more about drinking water regulations, go to Volume 2, and starting on page 545, there's an entire chapter that's dedicated to all the drinking water regulations that you'll need to know. Another common type of question that you'll see on the exam will be on sources of water. The state likes to test your knowledge regarding the common traits of groundwater and surface water. For example, this question reads, which water source typically has the highest concentration of dissolved solids? The answer choices are river, lake, stream, or groundwater. The correct answer is groundwater. The common traits of groundwater or that it has higher concentration of dissolved solids, minerals, and hardness. In contrast, the common traits of surface water are that it contains higher concentration of bacteria, suspended solids, and turbidity. If you don't know much about the common traits of groundwater and surface water, go to the textbook, Water Treatment Plan Operation, Volume 1, and on page 22, it covers the common traits of both groundwater and surface water. Another common type of question that you'll see on the exam is pumps. The state may ask you questions on the basic type of pumps and also the purpose of each pump part. This question reads, what is the purpose of the lantern ring? The answer choices are, transmits input power from the driver into the impeller, contains liquid and acts as a pressure containment vessel, increases the pressure of the liquid, or cools and lubricates the packing. The correct answer is D, cools and lubricates the packing. I'll explain why. In the upper right hand corner, we have a photo of a pump and motor. So the pump is on the left side and the motor is on the right side. In between, we have a shaft that connects the two together. The lantern ring is located on the right side of the pump. I'll show you a zoomed in photo. The bar going across is the shaft. Again, the pump's on the left side and the motor's on the right side. The lantern ring is noted by the letter B, and those black rings noted by letter A, those are called packings. The purpose of a packing is to minimize the leakage from the pump. The purpose of the lantern ring is to cool and lubricate those packings. It does so by taking some of the water from the discharge side of the pump, which drips onto the lantern ring. Water then is sent through those perforation holes then underneath the packings to cool and lubricate them. You want to cool and lubricate the packings because the shaft is spinning fast and it's rubbing against those packings. Therefore, you need the water to cool and lubricate the packings. If you want to learn more about pumps, go to the text Water Treatment Plant Operation Volume 2. Page 299 covers some of the basic type of pumps and also the different pump parts. Another common type of question that you'll see on the exam is chlorination. The question reads, what occurs in the first stage of the breakpoint chlorination curve? The answer choices are chlororganics and chloramines are formed. Chlororganics and chloramines are partly destroyed. Chlorine is destroyed by reducing compounds. Free available residual is formed. The correct answer is C. Chlorine is destroyed by reducing compounds. Let's go over the breakpoint chlorination curve so that you know why this is the correct answer. 
This is the breakpoint chlorination curve and it tells you what's happening to the chlorine that you're injecting into the water. Let's start on the left side of the graph, stage one. Here, the chlorine is actually being destroyed by what's called reducing compounds. They're things like iron and manganese that are naturally present in the water. Because chlorine is reacting with these reducing compounds, there are no chlorine residuals that are formed. Look at the blue line on the bottom. That's the chlorine residual concentration is close to zero. This answers the previous question. But for your benefit, I'll finish explaining the remaining parts of this chart. As you keep pumping more chlorine into the water, you move into stage two. Here you have the formation of what's called chlororganics and chloramines. They're chemicals that are formed when chlorine reacts with things like organics and ammonia in the water. Look at the blue line now, it's trending upwards. Now it means that we have chlorine residual in the water, but it's in the combined state. Combined chlorine residual is chlorine that has combined itself or attached itself to something else like ammonia. Combined chlorine residual is not as effective as free chlorine residual, which is what you want. We keep pumping more chlorine to the water. Now we move into stage three. Here, the chlororganics and the chloramines that you just formed are now being partly destroyed. The chlorine that you're injecting into the water is actually destroying what you just formed. Look at the blue line, it's trending downwards. The combined chlorine residual that was formed is now being destroyed. As you keep pumping more chlorine to the water, you move into stage four. Here, we have free chlorine residuals being formed. Look at the blue line, it's trending upwards. And that's the free chlorine residual that is being formed. The most important point in this graph is that dashed line between stage three and stage four. That's where the free chlorine residual starts to form. If you follow that dashed line to the bottom, that's the chlorine dosage that'll take you to the break point where free chlorine residual will start to form. If you wanna learn more about break point chlorination, go to the textbook, Water Treatment Plan Operation, Volume One. And on page 280, they describe it in more detail. Another common type of question that you may see on the exam is lab procedures. The state wants to make sure that you understand the basics of lab work. This question reads, which of the following is a strong acid? The answer choices are pH of one, pH of six, pH of eight, or pH of 13. The correct answer is A, pH of one. If you don't remember the pH scale, let's go over it quickly. This is the pH scale and it goes from pH of zero to 14. A pH of zero represents a very strong acid. A pH of 14 represents a very strong base. And in the middle, pH of seven means it's neutral. It's neither acidic nor basic. If you go from pH of zero towards pH of seven, the acid becomes weaker. If you go from pH of 14 towards pH of seven, the base becomes weaker. If you wanna learn more about the pH scale, go to the textbook. Water Treatment Plant Operation, Volume 1. And on page 570, it covers the basics of the pH scale.